on today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, as my voice is starting to go on me already. Uh, Madam Web tickets are on sale, and nobody's buying them so far. Uh, the first trailer for Henry Cavill's new The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare has come out, and I think it is a thoroughly Guy Ritchie kind of trailer. Also, it's now official Amazon Prime. They told us it was coming, and now it's here. They are now putting ads in their TV shows and movies, unless you pay three extra bucks a month. We're going to discuss that. James Gunn confirms once again that Batman, contrary to some rumors going around, will not appear in the upcoming Superman Legacy movie. The first image of the new Daredevil Born Again series with Matt, Karen, and Foggy all together has come out. What does that mean for the show? And it's now official. We've got our Supergirl for the DCU. She's got a little bit of uh, House of the Dragon pedigree in there we're gonna talk about that and a whole bunch more the john campus show podcast starts right now well greetings and salutations everybody welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the john campus show podcast coming from right here in our quaint little studio brought to you in part by our friends at mint mobile i'm of course your host John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV, and streaming, and all sorts of good things, not just giving you our opinions, but giving you information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or even different than ours. Uh, join me today, we've got Ray Ora. Hey, good morning. Jonathan Voico. Hello. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. And how are you all today? And most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here, making the show part of your day. And here's how the show's going to go. We're going to break it into two parts. First, we're going to start by talking about all those topics I listed off. Then in the last part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you're one of our beloved YouTube channel members, keep an eye on the community tab every morning because we ask you guys to throw in a bunch of free questions and comments and we address those. But if you're watching the channel and the show right now live, and you've got to be watching live, and you've got a question, thought, theory, or opinion you want to share, use the Super Chat feature in the live chat, and we will address those near the end of the show, as long as it's appropriate to be used on the show. All right, guys. With that down, let's jump into it, shall we? About 48 hours ago, I want to say now, uh, the announcement came out <clears throat> that Madam Web is coming, and the tickets are now on sale. On sale. You can go and get them right now. And we're not the only ones who noticed. One of our viewers noticed as well. And that is the topic of today's Mint Mobile hotline question of the day. Listen, guys, if you've got a topic and question for the show and you'd like to hear your voice on our show, go ahead and call our Mint Mobile hotline anytime, 24-7 at 951-268-4259. And today's is about the glory of Madam Webb. Check it out. Hey, John. This is Hayden from Tennessee. I just got a notification telling me that Madam Web tickets were going on sale, and I noticed that there hasn't been any, like, second trailer or anything, you know, kind of related to, like, the movie and the plot coming out. So are they just going to put this out and run with it with no extra context to the movie? Thanks. All right, Hayden from Tennessee. Thanks so much for calling me. And, you know, Madam Web is a really interesting because. On the one hand, year or so, I've been pretty intrigued by this movie because, you know, little parts of the story have come out of what the movie's going to be about. And I remember going... Uh, sorry, my mic turned off there. I, you know, Madam Web has been a, a big question mark, right? Because on the one hand, for like a year... I've been intrigued by this film because remember, at first we all said, why are you making a Madam Web movie? But then little bits of the synopsis started to come out. And I, I was really intrigued. I think a lot of us went, oh, you know what? That could be pretty interesting. That actually sounds pretty good. And then the trailer came out. And, and while there are upsides to the trailer, I'm struggling to think of the last time I saw a trailer where like all the dialogue in it was delivered so wooden. Mm-hmm. Which raises the fear, if this is the best stuff you picked out from your movie to put into your trailer, this movie could be in trouble. Well, the next red flag went off about, hey, uh, you know, it's been a beat since the first trailer came out. We're uh, two weeks from the movie coming out. And whereas most movies will traditionally have three trailers, sometimes four or five, sometimes two major ones and 40 TV spots, but 
traditionally about three, your first trailer, then your follow-up trailer, and then the big last trailer before the movie comes out, right? Yeah, yeah, two weeks from when this movie's come out, there's not been a second trailer a a at all. And that makes me wonder a little bit about what our friend from Tennessee is asking. It's like, do they not want to share any more context to the movie? Like, what's going on? And I don't think they are disconnected. The, the fact that they have put out one wooden trailer, not done anything to follow up with it, not really told any of us why we should be interested in this movie. And now that the tickets, have, again, the movie's just two weeks away, the tickets have been on sale for about 24 hours now. But as I go over to my AMC, you know, <laughs> website, and I go, well, we'll skip the 2.30 p.m. Let's go to the first kind of prime time screening. It's at 5.30 in the afternoon. Okay, this is opening day, Wednesday, February 14th, 5.30, IMAX, nonetheless, no less. Valentine's Day. Yep. Let's for dates. on it. And, uh... Oh, uh, you know what? My favorite seat's taken. I'm not going. Uh, your favorite of the one, two, three seats that, yeah, are, that are taken? They just happen to be. And maybe there's more seats taken there. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five seats taken. Five. Now, I don't know. Maybe the earlier show has more. I, I just went for the first prime time. Let, maybe people wanted to go to the first screening. Let's click on the first screening. Well, those they did. Yeah. Four tickets. Okay. Well, maybe the later in the evening? Let's go to the 830. That's the ticket. That's the one. Yeah. Boom. All those. Oh, there's more. Gone. Two, four, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 22 tickets. Prime seats gone. <laughs> the main, the, but the good ones are all gone. Like again, I, I don't think it's a coincidence. Now, look, I'm not saying that this movie was going to make $150 million opening weekend by any stretch of the imagination. But I think had they had a real ad campaign up until this point and they had put out a second trailer to give us a little bit of more of an idea about what's the idea of this movie and what are we getting if we buy tickets to go see this movie... I'm just I'm not saying they would have been sold out, but I'm just saying, Robin, that one screening, there would have been more than four. I think there is a direct correlation between just how few tickets, again, not that this movie was ever going to be a big opening weekend at all, and the fact that they... I, I, what's going on? We're two weeks away. They haven't even put out a second trailer for this thing. Are they telling us they don't believe in this movie? I don't know. What do you think? I think this is all a Doug Lyman plot to get Sony to actually buy Roadhouse from <laughs> from Amazon and put it in theaters because Roadhouse would definitely pre-sell more tickets than Madam Web, even if they didn't tell anybody it was coming out in a couple of 100 weeks. 100 percent away. No, I mean, I, look, dude, this is just another look. I really appreciate what Sony has been doing lately. You know, uh, the fact that they don't have a streaming service, they've been licensing out their content, they've been making some good moves. But what they've done with the Spider-Man, other than the Venom movies, what they've done, Morbius, now this. Who oh, knows? What don't we're let's not forget Into the Spider-Verse. I mean, well, yeah, the, but yeah. Th those are, yes, but I see those as kind of the Into the Spider-Verse things are kind of their own thing, you know, right. being- But they're still just Sony things. Lord and Miller, yeah, no, I, but that's what I'm saying. Sony's done a lot of great stuff. But with their live action, non-Spider people, I consider Venom Spider people, they're sure. symbiotes, yeah. you know. <laughs> but this to me is- Normally, if tickets go on sale with a comic book movie, they make some kind of an ad, like a social media, tickets now on sale. Big push. And they'll, big push. They'll give you 30 seconds of, of new footage or something. Um, this tells us all we need to know about this movie. <laughs> the fact I mean, that they're not telling us anything about John, the movie tells John, it us everything to me, we need to know. For I, I ran this joke into the ground. There's a Madam Web movie coming out. Well, now it turns out that I'm the only one that remembers there is a Madam Web movie coming out. Yeah. Unfortunately, and I, I it, look, Twilight I Dome. love Dakota Johnson. <laughs> you know, whenever I see her on on late night talk shows I like promoting her too, herself, very much. I think as a person, she's delightful. She always cracks me up. She seems like funny and and effervescent and i like her performance ever since that she was in the social network i'm like all right but and el royale oh oh yeah like yeah. she was so good in el she royale, was great yeah. she i i love her to death and that here she probably thought oh great i get to be in a comic book movie like i can see her as a person thinking this is cool i'm happy to do this you know it's another franchise like 50 shades of gray but not and so she gets to be in it and i hate to see the fate of this movie seems already sealed because Sony's given up on it. <laughs> and I, I, it just makes me sad. I think I'm going to go see this. I'll take Elizabeth on Valentine's Day just to give Dakota Johnson a little love. It's so strange because you say Sony gave up on this, on this IP, right? It's like 
someone years ago made the decision to do a Spider-Man less universe and whoever that person with immense power is, they have been going down this road. Tom Rothman. Yeah. And yet, Genius. And yet they'll, they'll put out these movies that are like, oh, we give up on it. So now I'm curious. We'll see what, what happens with the others. I, I mean, it's, it's, they, they've got Venom. Venom 3 is currently in production in Europe. You know, th then you have Craven coming out. Now you have this coming out. You've already had Mo Mobius come out. Um, you know, it's it's Mobin time. Remember that? <laughs> that was what a what a that set the world on fire. And it's it's amazing to me watching our business that we love so much, that we follow, that we examine, that this kind of stuff still happens. On the other hand, you got people like Jordan Peele putting staking their first look deal with Universal and their company Monkey Paw. They're like, we're gonna buy this movie. We're gonna bring it over to Universal and we're gonna put it out theatrically. On one hand, you have somebody putting their 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 money where their mouth is and doing something cool. And then in this case, how does this happen? I and, and look, <clears throat> let's let's call it what it is. We say this all the time. For all we know, the movie's brilliant. Like we have we haven't seen it. For all we know, uh, we're just talking about what they're how they're handling this because they're not giving us a lot of faith. Here's another really interesting question I have about the marketing campaign. You have in this movie, and maybe it's not a ton. You have the red hot, fantastic. Adam Scott. Right, I got this up here, John. Yeah. Who not only steals every scene he has in one of the greatest comedies of all time, Step Brothers, uh, one of the top, I contend, one of the top three greatest sitcoms in the history of television, Parks and Rec. But he's also one of the most, this star, one of the most talked about series going right now with Severance. And I think he's in the trailer for about a half second like i'm not saying it make it make it look like he's in every part of the movie because he's probably not but it, I, if i'm in charge of marketing over there i'm like hey we got adam scott in this movie at least put him up on screen for about five seconds of it i mean i just don't understand their strategy here i mean this is uh, this just occurred to me do you think they're looking at this because this is basically a girl power movie it's mostly female leads aside from adam scott that they're looking what happened to the Marvels, and they thought that maybe girl power superhero movies are not what is selling in the marketplace, so they've pulled back no, from what they planned on? No, not at all. I, look, Black Widow, despite the fact that it was in a pandemic and the whole day and date release on Disney Plus still made over $400 million. But she, had, she was an Avenger. I, regardless. It, it, that's completely regardless. Like, if the premise is comic book movies with girls just don't work. You can't start throwing in asterisks to say, except in this, like Wonder Woman made over $700 million. The first Captain Marvel made over a billion dollars. I like- Well, those because, movies are good because, too. Like, yeah, that's the, that's the <laughs> thing. I mean, Those you know. movies were good, Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because if you start going down that rabbit hole, well, well, it's because it's a female. Okay, then why did Flash fail at the box office? Why did Blue Beetle fail at the Flash off? Fail the box office. Why did uh, Man, Shazam really? two fail at the box office? Yeah, Why did all, Black yes. Adam fail at the uh, box that's, office? That's true, right? So, but but I would say that this is, uh, in terms of a known superhero brand, this is probably the least known. So they had the most opportunity to craft a marketing campaign and craft a narrative. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Right. So yeah. th that's why, like, because I'm intrigued by, like you, we're both intrigued by this movie. I mean, I think that this movie has an interesting premise. I think the character is interesting. I like the fact that this movie, as much as I joked about it for a long time, I like the fact that they made this movie. And to be honest, John, I'm very intrigued to see it. I just don't, like like all of us said, to quote Chris Carr, for why, when they first announced they were doing right. a Madam Web, like we're all like, you're, you're doing what now? So you like you're bang on the money. They had this opportunity to craft a narrative, to craft, and and like- Any say, narrative. Say what you want. 95% of the average movie going to the audience had never seen or heard of Madam Web. So you could create whatever image of this character you want. And they've done no narrative crafting. Like none, just like, okay, I know she kind of sees the future and this guy's coming to kill these girls. I have no, I got nothing else about which, this movie by the right way, now. what you just described is an intriguing plot that they could they could do more with and hit harder with, because you've got a little bit of Terminator in there, you've got coming out of the Spider Verse, and they could make these these ideas apparent to the movie going audience through decent trailers and decent marketing, which they're they're not doing. I mean, who puts superhero movie 
tickets on sale and doesn't make those in one day. Buy tickets to Madam Web. They haven't done any of that. It's when they should have dropped a second trailer. A second trailer, get it on one of the NFL football games, and then end the trailer with tickets on sale now. But they, again, I we're 15 days away from this movie coming out, and there's not been a second trailer. And by the way, there's nothing coming out. They're still touting the box office of the Mean Girls remake, they you know, huge for the third week. I mean, you have basically the Sahara Desert, uh, and theater owners are begging for product. You know, you have Godzilla versus uh, Godzilla minus one minus color has now become like the third biggest. <laughs> Godzilla minus one minus color. I, I mean, that, you know, opens up again. And, and you've got here's a movie that they could take advantage of the time it's coming out, and it doesn't seem like they are. Anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? I, I mean, they're not marketing this movie. They put out their first trailer, which is supposed to be the trailer that just gives us a little taste, little tease, and then you get the real trailers, and they haven't done it yet. We're like 15 days away. I don't know, guys. What do you think? Let us know down below. All right, guys. With that down, let's jump into this, shall we? Y'all know I am a big fan of one Hendrix Cavill. Did you guys do you guys know his real full name is Hendrix? Yes. I lied. It's I not. did not know that. <clears throat> no, I lied. I just made that up. Oh. Henry Cavill. He is my all-time favorite Superman. There he is right there. Mm. I just I think this guy is great. You put him into a movie like The Man from Uncle. Loved him in that. Loved him in The Tudors. I just love this guy. I think this guy's great. And I cannot wait. Supposed to go see him tonight <clears throat> in Argyle. But I, you can tell I'm a little bit on the weather. I don't know that I'm going to go now. But at Argyle, and now the new trailer coming with Henry Cavill and one of the directors I get the most excited about, Guy Ritchie, in the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. The first trailer has dropped. And I'll tell you what, I forgot that Alan Richson, Reacher, Reacher, is in this. Alex Pettifer, who like 12 years ago was poised to become one of the next big things in Hollywood. He never quite was able to crack that, even though he's a pretty good performer. I, I, I kind of like his performances, to be honest with you. Isaac Gonzalez, who I always love seeing in movies, she's great. But again, directed by Guy Ritchie and Wesley the Dread Pirate Roberts. And, <laughs> and it's a guy, this look, first thing I gotta say about this trailer, and Rob, you and I were talking about this before the show started. This is in its core DNA. If I knew nothing about this trailer, nothing about this movie coming out and you just played, I would have gone, Guy Ritchie directed this. By the way, Guy Ritchie's like the new Ridley Scott. Two movies a year, banging them out. Yeah. <laughs> and always banging out interesting. Yeah, and then doing a TV series stuff. based on The Gentleman too. You go, Guy Ritchie. I absolutely like, like the guy who did Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch is the same guy who did Aladdin. I mean, I mean, he married Madonna. I, I do hope. <laughs> this, yeah. I do hope in this movie though, because you mentioned Lock, Stock, and then Snatch. I hope this is kind of back to his old thing where everything starts to culminate at the end. You know, the yeah. different characters all culminate with the grand plan. You know, those but are so all, fun. But what we're seeing too, like Henry Cavill's character, is a definitive Guy Ritchie kind of character. Mm -hmm. Um, we've never really seen Henry Cavill like this before. I know, it's nice seeing that. And back-to-back -back Henry Cavill, Guy Ritchie movies. Right? Is Matthew it Vaughn. Oh, that's Matthew Vaughn. Matthew, yeah, yeah Argyle's Vaughn. Matthew Vaughn. Another same director. Same thing. Another, yeah, who's yeah. kind of cut from the same cloth a little bit as a yeah, Guy yeah. Ritchie. So, <laughs> they just trade off. Yeah, yeah, they, that's all. They just take turns. Um, I got to tell you what, I thought, look, there's going to be obvious comparisons to, like, Inglorious Bastards, Sure. There's going to be comparisons to like some of the other guy, Richie stuff. Sure. But I, I, I don't know, man. I loved this trailer. Was it a little corny here and there? Yeah, but I wanted a little bit of corny in this. Is, and isn't it great timing that Al, Al, Alan Richmond's in this? Yes. When Reacher is so like, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's just, it just worked out perfectly right now because he's so hot right now. It, it's actually made, it's a little, it surprises me a bit then that they didn't actually put him in the trailer a little bit more. Because if you blink at just the right spots, you might not even notice that Alan is in the trailer. Anyway, what do you think about the trailer, Rob? Okay, I really love the trailer. I thought it was a whole lot of fun. You know, I love World War II. Anything World War II, I'll watch. But you know what it made me think about? It made me think about, I'm watching this going, do you know what James Bond needs? It needs a movie like this. With this kind of tone, Bond became so 
morose and so woe is me. Bond should be fun. I want, <laughs> give me a Henry Cavill, Guy Ritchie directed James Bond movie set in a period, set in the 60s. Or even in the 50s. Like, they've never gone, they never, Bond was always a 60s period piece. But give me Cold War 1950s Bond and do a whole thing set in that era. That's when the novels took place anyway. I know. And that's why I'm thinking that, that I would love to see with this tone because this, I know it's a spy thriller and I know it's based on real events, but Guy Ritchie came in and said, we're going to have a good time. <laughs> I would love to see a Guy Ritchie directed. Like while, while everybody else is calling for like Christopher Nolan should direct a, a James Bond or a Martin Scorsese. You know what? I think a Guy Ritchie directed James Bond would be. Just Christopher Nolan's Inception is the closest thing I want him to do to a James Bond movie because it was kind of a James Bond movie. He In went to Peace ways, Gloria. Yeah. But I, look, this trailer I thought was so much fun. It made me really like a good trailer does. It made me want to go see this movie. It put us. How many fools got shot in this trailer? Many fools. Many Nazis. <laughs> and and apparently Cavill's like a Kiss fan because every time he murders somebody, he's got his tongue sticking out. Yeah. There's a little character quirk that I really like. Yeah, yeah. I, I love seeing Henry Cavill. Whatever I saw the him playing right now, it's so different from what I'm used to. And you guys forgot to mention Guy Ritchie's best, King Arthur, baby. Listen, I, I, will, not, <laughs> I will die on that. Hill. I, will I not, like that movie. Yeah, I like that movie. That, that movie's good. I thought it was, that was like my first introduction to Guy Ritchie. I mean, let's put it this way. That's a movie where when somebody tells me they hate it, I get it. Like, I get yeah, it. I get like, it. Right? Yeah. I get it. I can see why you didn't like the movie. But for me, it was actually quite <laughs> enjoyable. So I dope. love that Guy Ritchie. so good. Anyway, guys, <laughs> do you see the trailer? What did you think about it? Make sure you let us know. Okay, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? We live in an era where not only have the streaming wars begun... But we are in an era where the prices on all the streaming services, I feel like every three weeks, if I get a new announcement about prices going up, prices going up, prices going up, oh, that cheaper level? Yeah, we're eliminating it. That's what Netflix just did. They took their cheapest ad uh, free tier, just got rid of it. Um, like all this kind of stuff. Well, a while ago, an announcement came out from Amazon that, you know, if you're a Prime member, you have Amazon Prime Video. You can watch all the TV shows, all the movies, all that kind of stuff. Ad free. Except Amazon told us a little while ago that regular Prime members, all those TV shows and movies that have been ad-free, they will now have ads in them to uh, support the videos. Unless you pay three extra dollars a month, which for three dollars a month, they'll, they'll take the ads out. Now, <clears throat> I understand a lot of the uproar that we heard from some, some people. It's like, like, it's just another way for them to boost the prices on us. We've, I've been a member and I've had no ads and now you're just taking that away from me unless I give you more money. And I totally understand that perspective. But I want to propose that this is a little bit of a different situation than say Netflix, Disney Plus, Max, Peacock, when they increase their things. Because here's the thing about Amazon Prime. The video service is not actually what you're paying for. The video service is actually just an, a bonus benefit. Take a look at this. <clears throat> a lot of people forget that when you have Amazon Prime, you're actually getting a lot of stuff. For instance, if you're a Twitch person, Amazon Gaming, there's free games. There's also like free subs you can have. Like if you're into the Twitch community, stuff like that, they got a bunch of benefits if you're a Prime member that you can use over there on Twitch for free. Amazon Music, uh, Prime Reading. Anna and I just recently took advantage of this where you could like list, literally borrow books and stuff like that. Early access to certain things. But the main reason I have Amazon Prime, and I think the main reason most people have Amazon Prime, is free shipping. Two-day and sometime same-day delivery, free. To bind those toasters. And I, I'll tell you what, <laughs> Not to throw my wife under the bus. A lot of Amazon packages show up to my house every month. <laughs> I can't even get through the front door. And so, <laughs> I'm like, and these, it's, like, it's, it's like true. An adventure. It's like an action adventure. I'm starring and trying to find my way. I feel like phone. whenever you or Ryan come over, you're like also coming. You're like you also carrying in packages. Like, this was on your doorstep. I mean, and so that Prime membership saves me a lot of money. That's what I'm paying for. 
I'm not paying for the Prime Video Store. I'm paying for the free shipping and the two-day shipping and the same-day shipping. That's what I'm paying for. Oh, and as a benefit to that, I also get Amazon Prime Video. And so unlike Netflix or Max or Disney Plus or whatever, like guess what? If I have an annual subscription to Disney Plus, I don't get free passes to Disneyland. Fuck Disneyland. Um, okay. Unlike... You didn't have to bring up that analogy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, unlike w whatever else, right? This is like a thing. And so now Amazon has said, okay, look, Prime is still... We're, we're still throwing in Prime Video for free with your free shipping and your Amazon Music and your Twitch gaming and all. We're, we're still throwing in Amazon Prime Video. But if you want it completely ad-free, we're going to add three extra dollars. Look, I never like it when my prices go up, but this is, out of all the streaming services that have announced that they've been raising prices stuff, to me, this one is the most understandable, I, I think, to a degree, because of how much you still actually get. Half, half those things that were just on that graphic, I didn't know about. I had no idea there's an Amazon gaming. Dude, mm -hmm. seriously. Or Amazon reading. Or Look up on YouTube, um, like, either Amazon Prime benefits or or little known Amazon. I've, I've stumbled across a couple of videos to give you like, hey, there's like these 20 things, including like some kind of service where, oh well, yeah, Whole Foods, like Amazon grocery shopping. Yep. You get free special Amazon deals on Fresh. that. They'll like, they'll send you clothes to try on first. They've got that. Like I've seen these videos, like all these benefits, there's a lot you get for it. Mm, yeah. So anyway, Rob, the day has now come. The ads have started appearing on the stuff. Reasonable, unreasonable, could lead to other things. I don't know. How do you see it? I want to preface these comments by saying I've loved Amazon for the better part of a quarter century now. Loved Amazon. Okay? But here's the thing. Um, this month, today, for instance, Arrow Video releases Conan the Barbarian, the box set, in 4K. Grail title for me. Supposed to come out. Today's the release date. I'm not getting mine till the end of February, according to Amazon. <laughs> Last week, I was supposed to get The Raid, Redemption, The Steelbook. I couldn't wait for it because the transfer is supposed to be much better. Dieter Bastian said it was much better. Oh, am I getting that? Nope. Not coming till end of February. Okay, but now, but but now, you don't understand why that is though, right? Because a lot of, of third parties who sell through Amazon, they are responsible for their own shipping. Whereas the no, stuff no. that's housed in Amazon. No, like I, I know, but Amazon's always got me my discs when I need them on time. Never been a problem until lately. Now here's the thing. Amazon Prime, they've been giving this to us. They're now selling ads. They're selling ads where before they didn't have ads. So they have a whole new revenue stream of ads. So they're making a lot more money than they were before. And yet, then they're also making their Amazon Prime customers. Like, I got an email from them going, that I guess I had to authorize an extra payment a month, which I didn't hit a button. That, and so they're like, you're now getting an ad, uh, an ad tier on your Amazon thing. And I'm like, okay, let me get this straight. You now have a whole new revenue stream of ads, which you didn't have before, and you're now charging me more? I'm curious as to why. Now, maybe I wanted to write them back and go, if you make sure that my $3 goes to the SAG actors that need it and all the actors that appear and give them residuals, Give the WGA, the DGA, whoever, can my $3 go to their residuals? Because why is it they're getting now ad revenue and an extra three bucks from everybody? That's not a bad business. But no, 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 they're not getting three extra bucks from everybody. They're only getting three extra bucks from people who choose to opt in for the ad free well, version. Right, but, but choose like to opt all in. All the was... other services, you have to pay extra to have the ad free version. Of course, of course. But Amazon Prime's. One of their, they've already upped their ads, uh, their shipping service, what, by 25 bucks this year? So it already went up a substantial well, because, amount. You know, a few years ago, they only had at, at fastest Tuesday shipping. Today, I can literally get something in two to three hours. Well, yeah, because we got Amazon warehouse within yeah, 10 miles about, right? of our I do too. I need dog food. I I'm like, click. yesterday. But yeah, and it's, it's great. But I, I do think it's a little odd. I mean, I understand it's only three bucks, but you know, that's kind of everybody's attitude now. It's like, yeah, it's only three bucks, but three bucks times 10 or 20 different subscriptions. But again, I think it's important to keep in mind though, that this is an opt in thing, right? Yeah. Like they've introduced the ads and not raised the prices. Like this has always been kind of a free add on. We're putting in ads, not raising prices. But if you want the ad free, then just like Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu or anybody else, if you want the ad free, there's a premium I, to pay. I, I agree, but with Amazon Prime, 
part of that attractiveness, and it's not insubstantial. What is it? One hundred and seventy-five dollars a year now. Now we right use it. There, yeah. I use it a lot, so it's a great deal. Don't I get me wrong. I see that much a month. Yeah, it's an incredible <laughs> deal in shipping. I have no bones about that, but I do think it's odd that adding an ad tier is a big deal. That really changes the experience of watching something. And I think it's a substantial change. And it's interesting to watch where it's going to go. Do I, does it hurt me? Will I pay it? Sure. Because I like Amazon Prime. But I do find, I find it odd that they've added this extra premium. And I'm just wondering why. Why only $3? Well, again, to go so now to- I think of it as an ad, a, a premium, it's a streaming service I have to pay $3 a month for. Right, which is cheaper than what you pay for Netflix. Yes. I, and, and again, I, going back to the comparison of Netflix, Disney, the $3 difference between ad-free or ad-supported is the cheapest difference out of any of the major streamers. Because sure. the, the, for Netflix, the price difference between ad-supported and ad-free is about $7. For Disney, the difference between ad-supported and ad-free, I think, is 6 or $7 as well. So this is actually... They, Amazon has just made themselves the cheapest difference between ad-supported and ad-free. So why don't they use the $3 times however many Prime members paid them today to put Roadhouse theatrically in theaters and they have marketing money for it now? Dude, that's a totally different issue, but one I will happily talk about because damn right they should be putting that movie in. I mean, off. I'll tell you one you're, thing. You're just trying to push my buttons now. You're just trying to get me... Roadhouse will make more money than Madam Web. I guarantee you Roadhouse in theaters would make more money than Madam I guarantee you Roadhouse... Look, <laughs> okay, no, I'm not going to go uh, off uh, down uh, the road. I'm sorry. The whole point of this is I'm not upgrading. You know why? Because I don't watch anything on Amazon, baby. And when you do, it's at John's house, and he pays for it. <laughs> I yeah. know. But, I mean, listen, it, there's there's great stuff. On I, I know. There, it, it, <clears throat> dude, and they did this. It's interesting. I mean, they should have done this before Reacher started. They did it the week after Reacher was over. It, <laughs> when everybody really hooked on it, it's like, okay, now I mean, it's. It does feel a bit ransomy. Like this is your this is your current thing. If you want it, if you want your ads like gone again, pay us more money. That was a little I, weird. It was a little ransomy. Again, but I'm though, surprised. It's... No, I'll just hang on though. But I, I'm surprised because they would have made more money. I was thinking about this if they had instead done it the, the typical way. We're just gonna raise again, like everybody else does. Everybody else just raises it. But if you want to ad free, come down in, in in money. However, this is where they still make money. The ad free is still a dollar more than it is right now. Well, that's what Disney Plus did, right? Yeah. Disney Plus, they when they were introducing their <clears throat> ad supported tier, the first thing they did was announce that their prices were going up on everything. Yeah. Right. Typical retail trick. But we, and we also <laughs> knew that Disney at some point was going to raise their prices. Well, and and Netflix and who and mm-hmm. all of them do, right? But again, I think one of the things that really makes this different from all those others is that for most people, and, and, and correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, I think for the vast majority of people <clears throat> who have Amazon Prime, they didn't get it for the video no. service. No, you're right. They got it for the free uh, And they're not going to upgrade. And yeah. access to the video service. So in many ways, you could say that in many ways, the Amazon ad-supported tier is actually free. Yeah. Because I... I, I pay my $175 a month for my shipping. Yeah, it was going to go out anyway. No, right? that's, that's I'm getting 100%. Amazon for free. No, and, and that's why I say like this actually is Amazon doing you a little bit better because if they had done it my way or Disney Plus's way, they would have raised the price and give you a discount on ads, but the ads is still a dollar more than now. I, I guess I <laughs> guess what I find strange about it is like I, you pay Amazon Prime yearly. Why didn't yeah. they just add the $3 to Amazon Prime to the money that you're paying instead of now it's like a separate payment. Well, because it's an option of ads. It's so then an option, right, right, yeah. yeah. Right, but, right. But I think if they could find a way to do that, I think that would be good. Yeah, if, just, if they could find just a way put to it into my, it. what's bizarre, what's bizarre to me, it's like, take my money, Amazon, you're taking hundreds of dollars from me every month, I don't care. But 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 they made it a thing, mm-hmm. like it's a thing. And I'm like, <laughs> just ta- like, why am I looking at this, This it's kind of a little draconian. It's like, well, we've done this thing to you, now you must pay. I'm like, you do well, all kinds ran- of things to me and I love you for <laughs> that's it. That's the ransomy part of it. Yeah. Yeah, that it, it, also was speaks, weird. it also speaks to the power of their streaming and their quality and their content that now this is a thing and they didn't just slip it in because like my mom does to this day forgets that there's even video. She just uses it for yeah, the shipping. Same here. Yeah. So this will never affect her. But the fact that it is affecting a larger and larger audience, they're in the game, baby. Now, I also just for con- to put this in perspective, <clears throat> even once I sign up for, th- I haven't done it yet, but I will. 
Once I sign up for the extra three dollars to keep my video ad yeah. free, the taint of ads. <laughs> I am still going to be paying less for Amazon than I do for my Netflix. Oh yeah, and oh, yeah, yeah. I'm get my Amazon Music, and I get Twitch benefits, yeah. and I get my Kindle benefits, Dude. and I get free shipping, and and you're and. paying it's still less. Still the the best yeah. deal value. You're paying out there you're for, paying less than you for like Apple TV, and you're not getting Apple Music with Apple TV Plus subscriptions. Apple TV's I'm I guess Apple I'm great. just a little sore because Amazon got me my seventy five dollar old boy four K that's awesome from Neon, great. <laughs> it's so salty. But yet they don't get me Conan and they don't get me the Raid Redemption. Come on, man. So sure that has something to do with supply. I'm a simple man. I'm sure it has something to do with supply. Hey, if you add three dollars, they'll get it to you. <laughs> yeah, three extra yeah. bucks. It's right Boom, now. Boom, next day service. Right now, buddy. <laughs> All right, guys. With that down, we got to talk about uh, some James Gunn comments talking about uh, the progress on Peacemaker Season 2 and the presence or lack thereof of Batman in Superman Legacy. A first image of Daredevil, Matt, with Karen and Foggy when those characters weren't even going to be in the show has come out. And, of course, we've got our new Supergirl for the DCU. That and a few things more, but before we get to that, we're going to take a quick second and thank one of the sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. I've told you guys many times that after switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash camp. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for being my mobile service provider and for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's get on to this. Obviously, James Gunn has been big in the news in the world of movies lately. He is the new head of a brand new studio of a DC studio under Warner Brothers, <clears throat> something DC's never had, their own dedicated studio. And he and his partner, Peter Safran, are now the de facto Kevin Feige's of the DCU. Now, they're coming out of the gate in 2025 with Superman Legacy, a movie that goes into production pretty shortly here. The casting's been all done. But one of the big questions that have been going around, well, a couple of big questions. Number one is, we knew a Supergirl was coming, so who's going to be that Supergirl? Number two, where is the follow-up to the most popular and successful superhero TV show of all time, Peacemaker. I'm not saying the best superhero show of all time, but the, probably the most popular, the most viewed one, Peacemaker. Where is it? James Gunn got on threads. That's his kind of social media platform of choice now where he interacts with his fans daily on a couple things. Number one, a fan asked him, how's development coming on Peacemaker season two? To which he said, he is now halfway through writing episode eight, which is the final episode. So the script writing, he said, and it's a banger. He said, it's really a banger. Of course, he's talking about a script he's writing himself, so take that with a grain of salt. But it, it sounds like the script is just about complete. If he's into the last episode already, almost done, hopefully sometime soon we'll get some kind of word on when season two of, if you really want to, if you really want when's that going to come? When are we going to get a season two? All right. <clears throat> then the question moved on to the issue of Batman. Because despite the fact that James Gunn has kind of hinted and implied several times that we're going to have to wait a little bit for Batman, there, there's still been a lot of speculation that Batman may indeed show up in Superman Legacy. And I get it, because it seems like we're getting a lot of people in Superman Legacy, right? So are they going to pull the old DC model of having Batman and Superman kind of in the same movie right out of the gate? Well, James Gunn has now put that to bed a couple of days ago when one of his fans wrote to him, why can't Batman... Uh, appear in Superman Legacy. 
And can we see Batman in some other projects before his own film? To which James Gunn simply said, well, he can't appear in Superman Legacy because he's not in the script. <laughs> Very direct. Just like he's been getting more and more direct lately because yesterday we talked on the show about somebody who's asking about the reports going around that Matt Reeves' Robert Pattinson's Batman 2 has been canceled. And somebody asked him on threads, oh, this is going around. Have, have this, has this been canceled? One word answer, no. Has not been canceled with an eye rolling emoji. He's been getting kind of short and sweet. <coughs> Rob. I know how most people, including you and I, feel that while I liked Batman versus Superman, it was a mistake to have Batman first introduced in this universe with a Superman I film agree. under that under the circumstances that that movie was happening in. Is there an argument to be made though that <clears throat> James Gunn has already let us all know when the DCU, this not the DCEU, but this new DC universe starts? We are joining it already in progress, right? Superheroes are already a part of the world, right? We are entering into a universe where superheroes are here, have been around for a while, all that kind of stuff. And we're being introduced to this universe. A different situation, different context than say, uh, you know, the, uh, the old DCEU was. Is there an argument to be made that it, there might be some benefit to actually introducing a Batman in this? I mean, clearly he's not going to be there, but could there be an upside to this? Or does James Gunn absolutely take the right approach here to save him till later? I think he's absolutely taking the right approach. I mean, this is going to seem strange sort of to some people, but I think that what James Gunn is doing, he's obviously a huge fan of 80s DC. And in 80s DC, they famously had the DC universe had become so convoluted People couldn't jump in. It was difficult to understand, so they had Crisis on Infinite Earths, which I loved. You know, they took all the DC multiverse and they collapsed it into one Earth. And they basically rebooted all their big characters. George Perez came on and did Wonder Woman, and they leaned into the mythology of it all. And then John Byrne took over Superman, and they did that. I think James Gunn is thinking about the DC EU as post-crisis DC in the 80s. Ah. And they're going back. Some of the comics were rebooted from the beginning. And that like Superman's powers are being redefined by John Byrne. His relationship with Lex Luthor was different. And and Wonder Woman went more back into the Greek gods and all that. I think he's looking at that as as the way to go. Not to emulate what went on in the comics themselves, but the idea was okay, this one universe went away. It's still DC, but they had to start again. You know, and they had to start again. He knows the, the, the audience will go with him. What he has to do with Superman Legacy is to say, this tone is now totally different. We are now starting from scratch, and it's a very different thing than you're used to. So what he's going to do is present whatever that tone is and whatever he's set up moving forward. That's not to say a Batman movie can't have a different tone, but it's going to be a, a different the foundational philosophy behind what he's going to do is different. Now, the thing is, Batman's probably going to have a different tone. He doesn't want to put... If you put Batman in a movie that has a Superman tone, then your Batman could be compromised. And I think that he doesn't want to do that. He still wants Batman to be the Dark Knight detective or, you know, the, the Denny O'Neill, uh, uh, Neil Adams Batman of the 70s, or whatever he's going to do. But if you put Superman and Batman conflicting with that tone in the same movie, I think it's it, it denigrates uh, or makes it more difficult to pull off. And you can't, I think what he's, I think he has a clear vision of this. I still think it goes back to a Superman for all seasons. And I think we're going to get something new, fresh, classic. And I'm really excited for what James Gunn has in store because I think he really knows what he's doing because if he didn't, they wouldn't be so gung ho about it. I think he really knows. I think he has a clear head. I think everything that he's ever made is leading up to this. And I'm expecting a banger of a Superman movie. Indeed. I expect John the best Superman movie ever made. Whoa. That's, that's because all order. If it's not, he's failed. I disagree. I, that's like saying if anybody makes a crime movie, you were going not as really good as the Godfather. Yeah, no, no, failed. but he's, but he's, it has to be because he's be. not only not only does he have to make the best Superman movie, he has to establish a brand new universe. If it doesn't work, if it isn't the greatest, or or at least approaches the greatest Superman movie ever made, I'll, I'll go with you on that. 
there's too much riding on this. Oh, 100%. I, and again, we've said on this show, right, Rob, that not to add any more undue pressure onto James Gunn, who, of course, watches this show daily. Um, not to put any undue pressure on James, but it's like there's never been a more important Superman movie. Right. Because, okay. I'll give you an analogy. Yeah. It doesn't have to be Godfather. It has to be Goodfellas. I'll go with you on that. Because because not only every movie needs to be good, right? But and it's unfair, but it is the way it is, kids. Yeah. Sometimes life's yeah, not yeah, fair. Yeah. He's got to establish a brand new universe. Uh, not just make a movie good for its own sake, but make it so good that it makes people excited for what's to follow. Yes. And it has to be good enough to wash away the bad taste out of people's mouths for the past number of years for the other stuff that's come, that's come out, right? And get get comic audiences back that the DC characters have not been able to get over the last, uh, other than Aquaman crossing 400 million. And look what he's introducing. He's introducing Green Lantern. He's introducing Supergirl. He's introducing Lois. He's introducing Jimmy Olsen. And he's introducing Lex. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I, I do want to point one thing out. I, I see a lot of people. It's become a kind of a the trendy thing to say. I've been seeing a number of people in our live chat saying things like, people are, are tired of Batman. People need a break from Batman. Blah, blah. Really? Because they just put out a Batman movie not long ago. And it doubled what any other DC movie did at the box office in the past five years. You take all the last eight or nine movies that the DCU put out, and that one little Batman that you're saying people are over did almost double what any of them did, making almost $800 million. People love Batman. I, I, I would say objectively the notion that people want to break from Batman is objectively wrong. I, I, I think people. I think the last movie proved it. People are willing, even with Twilight Boy Twilight. playing the role, <laughs> people are willing to flock out to the theaters if you make a good Batman movie. And I, I think that kind of proves the point. You're a hundred percent right. A good Batman movie, everybody, people, every generation loves Batman. You got Batman watchers going all the way back to '60s with Burt Ward and Adam West, and people have been watching Batman their whole lives. And you give people like, look, look, Twilight Boy, Batman. No one thought that was going to work. No one we thought knew that it would work. You well, yeah, I mean, it was, it was it was Twilight Boy. Twi Matt Reeves <laughs> delivered. On. And by the way, Twilight Boy deserves. I mean, you know, he's one of the best things about Tenant. He's got oh, a great. Sure. He's got a great yep. indie career. I think Pattinson uh, Dude, is rover. a great Come actor. Come on! As soon as I saw the Rover, I'm like, this guy's amazing. He's the Rover. He was rover, great in that. Good time. Like, it's just he's he, good he's time. A really great. And, he's great. He's and, a great actor. And going back to James Gunn, he he knew what he signed up for, right? Yes. Uh, not not yeah. a, not how important this Superman uh, movie is, but. The trailer, the first trailer is just as important to get everyone on that board. They are going to have to spend months and months on that first trailer. I, I because it, it will not be as important as the Force Awake, not the Force Awakens. I'm sorry, as uh, the Phantom Menace trailer. That's probably the single most important pivotal trailer in the history of movie trailers. But this trailer, this first trailer for Superman Legacy has got to kill it on every level. Yeah, but, but I would also say one of the really interesting things about this film, and I think people forget, is how long he's taken to cast it. He yeah. has tested people, he has brought people in, he's been casting this movie for months. I don't think there's been a movie that's been made, I can't remember the last time a movie has been made where they've spent this long casting the film. And when has James Gunn ever let us down? Never Slither, yet. Slither, super. Three Guardians of the Galaxy movies, Peacemaker, Suicide Squad. These are all wildly entertaining movies. You might not dig all of those, but I mean, come on. I own all those movies. He's done a do. and I own his novel, The Toy, the, the Toy Collector. So I'm a huge James Gunn fan from way back. He's never let me down. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Speaking of like some of the biggest and some of the best comic book superhero television shows of all time in that conversation will always have to be the Netflix Daredevil series. Now, of course, a long time ago, they announced that they were going to bring Daredevil back or, you know, into the MCU, but it became clear, despite some people were in denial about it, it wasn't going to be the same Daredevil from the Netflix series, even though it was going to be Charlie Cox, even though Vincent D'Onofrio, they made it clear it wasn't gonna be the same guy. But then Kevin Feige got his power back. They scrapped almost everything they did, almost everything, not quite everything, but almost everything they did, 
on making Daredevil Born Again, and they did a complete 180 on their direction, decided, you know what? We are going to make this the same Daredevil before. Now, because of the, the former, Foggy wasn't going to be in the new series. Karen wasn't going to be in the new series. And then just recently, we finally got word that, yeah, because this is now the Daredevil that was from Netflix, Karen and Foggy are back. And now it's the tangibilization of that. Because a video clip got released online where you see a little law office with the sign Nielsen, Murdoch, and Page, and then the door opens, and the three of them together again Just come the walking three out. Of us. And I'll tell you what, it felt good seeing the three of them together on screen again. Now, from what we understand, neither Foggy nor Karen are gonna have huge roles in the show. Like from what I've heard, and, and by the way, I can't verify this, so it might be right, it might be wrong. The, the whispers I'm hearing is that they're going to be in about three episodes of the uh, probably like 12 or 13, <laughs> which is fine, whatever. The main point is they're back. They're back, baby. And, you know, a lot of fans have been seeing this and been very, very happy about it. Because, Rob, here's why I think this is important. And if they had continued on with him not being the Daredevil from the Netflix series, they would have needed to come up with characters to fill this role because I think one of the key essential elements for a superhero is their surrounding characters because we we totally as the agree. audience kind of identify with the hero through the care the the normies if you will characters around them right and those characters are the ones that keep our heroes usually grounded and 100 and who they are and i think foggy and karen really represented that for daredevil in, in the netflix series and I think that is something that was maybe even missing a little bit from his appearance in She-Hulk, although there was a lot to be desired about the She-Hulk stuff. But I think this is an important scene to get out, even if they're not in a lot of the show, just knowing that their presence in there, I think makes us a little bit more, I think it makes Matt a little bit more identifiable. I think it allows us to connect to Matt more because we're doing it through these surrogates that he has on screen. So I think it's kind of key. What did you think about this? I think it's 100% right. I mean, they, they talk about how they're going back to the Netflix show. These... Karen and Foggy were essential components of of that. And by the way, Karen in the original Born Again storyline plays a role. So, I mean, it's really interesting to see. I, I'm sure she's not going to play the role she played in the comic miniseries, but I do think that this is a, a, a real step in the right direction. And I think, look, when they said they retooled this series, they've really gone back and retooled it. And, you know, kudos to them. And I think all the, the moves they're making... Uh, are good ones. I'm hoping that what they're doing with uh, Captain America: Brave New World is the same is the same thing. They've seen. I I really do respect that Marvel understands as a problem. They've gone back. They've looked. They've reassessed. Kevin Feige has more power, like you said, and they're making the right moves for the material that they're making because they were John the most successful franchise in Hollywood history for a while the marvel cinematic the marvel universe. cinematic yeah. universe and all this stuff and this stuff is too important to let fall apart i mean they don't want the amount of tickets that madam webb is selling to no. to to be a what's going on by the way uh, to look at this picture again you know because uh, jonathan had brought up some of the old pictures of foggy but foggy's grown up Got that fade. He's got that he's got the fade going on. He's got the uh, the gentlemanly uh facial scrub uh mm. going on. Karen looks the same, but it yeah. uh, looks like <laughs> She's also got the facial scrub. No. It, Karen looks the same, but Foggy looks like he's grown up a little bit. I do hope his character's a little less whiny. His oh, delivery is less yeah. whiny. I hope he holds a little bit of that though. That's, that's bit, part of the point the game a bit of his Every charm, right? Just... I I kind of liked it. I mean, Foggy in many ways is Foggy is to Daredevil what Happy is to Tony. <laughs> yes. Right? And it's like you want a little bit of that kind of quirkiness in their characters to play off our heroes a bit. So I hope he holds on to a little bit of that. I'm really excited. Yeah. I'm Thank really you, excited. How does this affect uh, Amazon deliveries, though? <laughs> <laughs> if it's good, will you get your discs faster? I don't know, man. Just get me my Raid Redemption Steelbook, please. Please, God. <laughs> Please. All right. <laughs> With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Uh, of course, the new DCU is is uh, quickly coming upon us. 2025 is now all, not all that long away. And one of the big casting decisions that's kind of been up in the air that we've been talking about lately is who's going to be Supergirl. Now, a report came out about a week or two ago about the three finalists that have come up to the role. And one of those finalists 
is now our Supergirl. As it has been reported and James Gunn himself has now confirmed. Deadline said the, the headline, Supergirl, New Woman of Steel is House of the Dragons, Millie Alcock, to which James Gunn immediately wrote, this one is true. Welcome to the DCU, Millie Alcock, uh, coming us from Deadline. This is how good of an actress this girl is. Although, let me preface this by saying, my sample size of her acting prowess is limited to House of the Dragon, right? <clears throat> I don't really, I'm not really familiar with her work outside of that. But she was so good in House of the Dragon that when they ultimately hit the inevitable part of the story that they had to now bring in a new actress for the aged up character. And that girl was wonderful. The aged up one was great. But even though the new one was great, everybody's like, bring back Millie, man. Yep. She was just too good. She was great. She had the ability to play in House of the Dragon, a vulnerability, a fragileness sometimes, a strength other times, and a ferocity at other times. There's that one scene <clears throat> when her uncle's getting on everybody's ass and she decides against her father, the king's wish, she rides her dragon out there. It's like, what's up? You want to go? Let's go. I mean, it was like, so she was able to show all of that in this wonderfully complex, fascinating character. And she brought it all to life. Now, I'm sure the other, if they were finalists, I'm sure the other actresses in question would have been great in this role too. I just said at the time, because I'm most familiar with Alcock's work, I, I know she'll probably kill this. So I'll tell you right now, Rob, I am thrilled that she got this. I would have been good with the others as well. Totally would have been good with it, but I am kind of really thrilled that she got this. What do you make of this? Uh, me too. Uh, and again, you have to understand, I, I want you know the people that watch this show and fans of, of DC and fans of comics to understand just how important it was that James Gunn was able to do these tests to spend, I mean, he spent months doing this. So the people, he's probably been doing chemistry tests with the actors together with the other actors. You know, Corn Sweet and probably her were, were doing tests together. He probably, and they put them all on film and they had to see because that, that's how important this is. So this is not some willy-nilly casting choice. I think that we're going to get a Supergirl and she's going to crush it because she already crushed it for him. And not just him, but Peter Safran and probably David Zaslav too. And and James Gunn, you know, he had to pit, make his pick, but then he had to go to the studio. He had to go to Zaslav and say, this is who I want. And everybody had to be approved by the higher ups, even though he's the head of the studio at DC. And so that's another reason to get very excited about this entire process because whatever we're getting with this Superman movie has been carefully curated by the director and by the head of the studio at DC, both of them, because they're the same guy, and by Warner Brothers at large. So we're going to get something, I think, that has the kind of thought put into it that we don't normally get. So that alone should make us excited for this. By the way, she's going to be great. She is going to be great. And, and this comic that, series is a—it's a badass yeah. comic series too. Well, t tell people a little bit about. Well, I mean, about, the one they're going, she's on the she's almost before. like a slave on an alien planet, you know, that she has to break free. And if, in a way, her—I am sure that her ferociousness in House of the Dragon is what put her on the list in the first place. But like you and like me, we don't know anything else. James Gunn brought her in, and he probably was blown away by her. Because in that story, the sweet, minute Kara Zorel, that's not this super girl. No. If you're not familiar <laughs> with the story that James Gunn is basing this on, it's a little bit of a different take on Supergirl. Now, I'm seeing some people in live chat, and I get this, because I've, I've said this sort of thing about other characters before, saying, hey, she's kind of small. She's going to have to get jacked. I would I would suggest, no, she doesn't. Nope. Like, this, like, she's not Wonder Woman, right? Wonder Woman, a literal Amazonian, right? Like that, whoever they cast to be Wonder Woman next has got to get big, fit, jacked, all that kind of stuff. Supergirl's power does not come from her physical fiber muscles. Mm -hmm. She's Kryptonian. Yeah, she's alien. So, I mean, she's clearly in really good shape. I mean, that that's all, but that her power is not her. It's not like Reacher's power comes from the fact that Alan Richin is a massive human being. 
that's not where Supergirl's power comes from. No, like, no. but she'll like, get fit. I mean, oh, she'll yeah, want to look great in the role. Belly. No. Yeah, yeah she's not going to yeah. with a beer belly. Well, even in the Flash, uh, the Supergirl yeah. in that, it's not like she was ripped and we believed it. No, yeah. but she was great. Oh, yeah. I loved her. Oh, uh, oh what was her name again? Uh, ben, ben. Was no, it? It's, uh, oh, the not, Supergirl series? Or no, no, not the Supergirl from Flash. I'm not, I'm not. I forget. She was really good. She was great. But I, you know, they're Sasha old. Kaye. Sasha, Sasha Kaye, Kaye, right. thank you. Oh, I um, but, I, you know, and I would have been fine uh, if James Gunn wanted to use her, but this is a new universe. This is a new iteration of the character and something different than what her Supergirl was. And so um, I think this is great. It's I, great. <laughs> I'm great very excited game. to see what they do with this now. They just got to make sure they make a good movie around her. And because uh, that, guess what? You have the best casting in the world. If the movie's not good, it won't matter. Yeah, so again, no pressure, James, but uh, <laughs> but but there it is. All right, guys. Listen, with that down, we're now going to go over to the most important part of the show, which is taking questions from you guys. But before we do, we're going to take another moment here and thank another sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at Fume. We want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Fume. Quitting cold turkey is great in theory, but you and I both know it's way more difficult than that. And that's why there's a better way to break your bad habits. We're not talking about some fake online promises. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume. And they look at the problem in a different way. Instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavor air device that does just that. See, instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy. I personally didn't know what to expect when I first got my Fume. I mean, I've never liked vapes, but my goodness, the taste. The first time I tried it, I was completely sold on it. It was incredible. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume and accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use the code CAMPIA to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use the code CAMPIA to save an additional 10% off your order today. And thank you to our friends at Fume for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's get over to your questions. Jonathan, what we got first? First off, we got Culture Wars Diplomacy, who writes a uh, writer of, of a D&D adventure is in the MCU uh, and will. So there you go. I Sorry, I, I was reading the wrong question. What what answer? You can answer that. I, 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 I don't know anything about a D&D adventure writer, but if she's in the if Anne will, does that mean she's writing for the MCU now? Let me see. I, I I, I'm unclear, but if that's the case, that's cool. All right. What's next? Does that mean a writer on the D&D movie? Or was it a writer on like some of the D and D stuff? Yeah, that's what I. That's what I was. Yeah, and will, man. I. You know what? I watched. I've. I bought D and D the the movie on four K. It's so good. A wildly entertaining movie too. Listen, I'll tell you what. That it's it's just fun. I really hope they do another one because I I I get it did not do well financially, right? Even though I'm a big fan, I can't spin it. It did not do well financially. Characters have great depth. It was a wonderful little film. I think that's the kind of movie. That'll get a big audience on cable and and and. Uh, well, it was on a lot markets. of the streaming charts for a while, but you know what? It was one of those movies where I got a lot. You remember this? Prior to it coming out, a lot of people were constantly writing me saying, "I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, so I don't think I'd get the movie." And they didn't do a good enough. They should have done something in their marketing campaign to really make it clear to people, you never had to have played the game to enjoy this movie. If you've never played a game in D and D, you should. But if you haven't, yeah. This movie is still totally for you. It's, a I it's totally fun. I never yeah. have, and I loved it, and I followed it just fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's next? All right. Sanchez Guy says, Hey, guys, do you know NBC's American American uh, Ninja Warrior and ABC's Wipeout? They were my favorite shows I used to watch. Well, I mean, they. I was at, was NBC, was it in Universal's lot where they actually had the American Ninja Warrior course set up. Yeah, I get a big kick out of American Ninja Warrior. Um, actually, I get a kick out of the Japanese version, too. Um, I really wipe out, not so much. I, I, I tried watching Wipeout when uh, John Cena was host. I think was one of the hosts of it. Did not work for me. But but American Ninja Warrior, 
Because that's real. I mean, that's like you're watching people do things that are inhuman. It's yeah. incredible. But, but our viewer up, makes it sound like it was from a long time ago. It yeah, wasn't it's still that going on. Ago. And they set up a meet in Mayhem Ninja Warrior when that movie was about to come Did out. Did they? I think so. Tell promote it? Yeah. All right. What's next? Um, we got <clears throat> CM Waters, film enthusiast. Uh, first time super chatter. How, Thank you, CM. Yeah. How much of a chance do you think F4 has, uh, even if it's good at connecting with today's audiences? I think it has, if it's good, a very good chance. Look, with all the boo-hoos that people do, and, and we do around here sometimes too, about the current state of the MCU, the reality is when they put out a banger, like Guardians 3, that made over $800 million. Like people still go see it. If Fantastic Four, if the word gets out that Fantastic Four is really good, uh, and they put a great marketing campaign behind it, it's going to do well. It, it will. But as Rob always says, it's all about whether or not the movie's good. If they put out a movie that's kind of on the same level as Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, like ho-hum mediocre like the, the Marvels was, maybe not. But they've got a lot going for it. And uh, once they announce the cast, by the way, I'm not going to say why I'm saying this. By the end of next week, we will have the Fantastic Four cast. No. <clears throat> Wow, that really? That's, I, I'm not saying really. I'm just saying that's that's what I'm calling. Okay. At the end of next week. I mean, look, I, I would say this. The, the potential for a Fantastic Four movie, you know, the family dynamic. I I, I was just reading. I was going back and I was reading um, some of the John Byrne run from the 80s, one of my favorite comic runs ever. It is so much fun. It's huge and cosmic and crazy. But if they cast it right, and they have a dynamic, a family dynamic that's just irresistible to watch. They could make that movie great. And they know they have to. Yeah, they really do. All right, what's next? We got <laughs> Sam Fisher. I checked Guy Ritchie's uh, IMDb. He's directing an average one feature-length film a year since King Arthur. That's wild. He's keeping himself very yeah. busy. You know what he's not busy on? Aladdin 2. That's still amazing to me. That's the, I think that has been one of the big casualties of the the slap at the oscars because that is a movie that was set up at the end to have an open door for a sequel it made over a billion dollars at the box office and uh yeah no uh no aladdin 2 for you all right what's next we got damaris love who says <laughs> just got uh order of my graphic novel of supergirl woman of tomorrow and millie is going to kill it likewise she is an uh and Damon should have killed Pimp Daddy Hightower, <laughs> but I have faith in James Gunn. With all the killing that goes on in uh, the world of Game of Thrones, many times ago, more killing should have been done. But you're right, man. She's I, I think she's going to do great. Now it's all going to come down to the material. It's all going to come down to the material. Do they write a great character for her? Do they write a great story around Superman and this new DC world? Or is it going to be flat? We'll find out. James Gunn has never let us down, so here's hoping he doesn't start now. All right, what's next? Enrique <clears throat> says, hi, y'all. John, yesterday you said that Encanto uh, was a day-and-date release. I, it had a theatrical release and was released on Disney Plus a month later. I thought they were released on the same day. Hold on a second. Um, Encanto Disney Plus release date. Um, it says December 24th. It was released on um, Disney Plus on December 24th, 2021. And the Encanto theatrical release date was, I thought they were the same day, but maybe they were different days. You're right. The theatrical release was November 24th. So that just makes the point even more relevant to what we're saying. Theatrical release equals better results on streaming. So yeah. I thought it was they were the same day. So yeah, you're right. They were one month apart. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, what's next? Oh, mm. Chef Rigo. Chef, Chef Rigo. Rigo. Nothing screams, I'm excited for the show Shogun more than pre gaming with Shogun for Shogun. I'm excited for this show. <laughs> Shogun. I'm excited for this show. Those of you who don't know, our viewer, uh, Chef Rigo, is the uh, head chef over at a restaurant that we like a lot, but we haven't gone to in a while. We haven't gone in a while. We got to go soon because I really I love that place. Shogun is an amazing it place. It is. Amazing place. All right. What's next? We've got uh, Venkat, uh, who, oh, just uh, some support, but thank you for $10. Thank you, Venrem. And then another, and then he leaves a message here, so that's 20 all together. John, finally, at 30 years old, I started uh, playing D&D, &D, and I love it. Nice. But, man, miniatures can so easily escalate into emptying my pockets. Mm. 
Any suggestions for cheaper D&D miniatures? Yeah, don't don't use miniatures. <laughs> yeah. You don't no, mo to. most of the D&D playing I've done in my life. Now I get it. If you watch like videos of like Joe Manganiello's D&D game and stuff like that, they're like they'll they'll move figures around boards and stuff like that and you can do that. But honestly, most of the D&D campaigns I've played in my life have just been with pencil and paper. Now, of course, we at home, we ha we built a custom table. I'm, I'm not sure. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull it up here. But we had, we created a, uh, designed and made a table. Let's see if I can bring it up on screen. <clears throat> yeah, you can bring this up. Um, I had a 65-inch TV that we weren't using anymore. And a good friend of mine who's been on the show, is a uh his name's spencer is a hollywood uh set designer that's what he does he builds and designs sets and things like that so he had this great idea for <coughs> taking the 65 inch tv and building a gaming table around it and it's got you can't tell just from the pictures but there's like cubbies all along the side to keep dice and power cables for laptops and, and iPads and all this kind of stuff. And anyway, instead of using like physical miniatures, our game master would have these little images representing our characters and she would just move them around the maps on the table. So right there, the table would bring up the maps and the pictures of creatures and she would just move digital things of our things around. It's it was a lot of fun. We <coughs> made it ourselves. There's a video of it up on our YouTube channel, um, so you can check it out. But but again, I, I, hardcore D and Ders a lot of you will use the miniatures and all kind of stuff. But you don't need them. You really don't. So that's that's how I would go about it. All right, what's next? Um, 100 Movie Marathon says, "Love it when you talk, guys talk sports." Coming from a Dallas Cowboys fan, just know nothing you say could hurt me more than the Cowboys do every year. <laughs> oh, oh. Hey, listen, man, as a Toronto yeah. Maple Leafs fan, I feel you. As a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, I feel you. But imagine being a Detroit fan. I mean, look, you weren't supposed to make it to the Super Bowl this year. You got beat by the number one team. No shame in that. But I mean, I always talk about how. Sports fans don't understand pain until you've been a Toronto Maple Leaf fan. Because as long as I've drawn breath on this earth, the Toronto Maple Leafs have never even been to the Stanley Cup Finals, let alone won one. <clears throat> now they're the Detroit Lions. So the only sports fans out there who I think can understand my pain are Detroit Lions fans. I think they get it too. But they had a great season, man. And they're going to be dangerous next year. All right, what's next? CS, the director, writes, tell your wife I, I said hi, John. She knows what's up. And also CS, the director, says, how much did you pay her, mail order bride? <laughs> wow. You would think. You would think that Dr. Ann can't be. I mean, listen, this girl, um, four degrees, working on her doctorate right now, vice president of a major international marketing company. She's been a senior at Apple, Amazon, uh, <coughs> Hasbro. She's been the political field operative for a California congresswoman. She is our game master. She's our dungeon master in our D&D &D games. She's a comic book collector, hot toy collector. Uh, I mean, she uh, is... I mean, my John, wife, I, listen, I'm not going to lie to you. And I'll, I'll, this is a flex. She's the ultimate woman. John my won. wife is the ultimate woman. <laughs> John uh, I'll, won. Oh, I've got to say... <laughs> I win a life, man. That's also, just it. Also, my older sister married a Canadian... For a minute there, I was thinking, hey, is there some under the table? Oh, really? I didn't know he was Canadian. Yeah, yeah Stan. There, is, was there oh, yeah. like some Trump, under the table? A Canadian, a white Canadian nerdy Star Wars fan from the Toronto area. I know. I always thought there was like some under the table deal with Canada. Yeah, Philippines. you think Anne and Olive like got us on a two yeah, for one like... deal or something. <laughs> Let's see if you can find another Canadian. All right, what's next? Uh, Jay Loco says, Will, Pol uh, Will Poulter as Superman, now they're real cousins. <laughs> Because he looks like Millie Al uh, Alcott. Oh, he kind of, yeah, he does. You're right. I never yeah. thought about that before. Wow, you just ruined. All right, what's uh, next? Uh, Reggie Phoenix says, with hindsight, uh, if it came down to each of you, what would you give the best picture to La La Land or Moonlight? Moonlight. Yeah, I, I really... Yeah. No hesitation. And, and listen, I loved La La Land. Me too. It's a 
masterfully made movie. Fantastic. But it never made me feel the, the types of things that Moonlight made me feel. And, and the, just this emotional roller coaster the whole movie took you on, it was just, it hit me harder than La La Land. Again, I, love, I would have had no problems if they said La La Land wins. I would have been totally cool. And they did say that, and then they had to take it back. <laughs> but I mean, I would have had no problem with that, but I, I think Moonlight's the better movie. I mean, I do. I just watched La La Land a couple weeks ago. I still, I love that movie so much, but Moonlight resonates. You know, Moonlight is more, I think, universal. But La La Land's more fun. All right. Uh, what do we got up next? We got Raf to, uh, to, to Dorov. February going to be a banger, y'all. We're going to get Shogun doing two, Tokyo Vice season two. Can't wait. I haven't seen Tokyo Vice. Uh, but I, I hear it's great. I loved it. I read the original book that it's based on, which is fascinating because it's it. The TV series is different than the book, but Ansel Elgort, he's he's great in that role. I love Tokyo Vice. Loved it, and the, and, the and trailer of course, looks... Shogun coming this month. Dear heavens, I mean it's. I I, I have never been this excited for a TV show. I've never been this excited. I'm gonna do what Chef Rigo said. I'm gonna watch Shogun again to pregame for Shogun. The I, that's a good idea. Yeah. The OG. Yeah, because I have it on Blu-ray. All right, there what's next? Um, Culture War Diplomacy. I got free shipping with my Amazon content. Does Prime also have more obscure, older free movies uh, than the other services? They do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I don't they have a bunch on old. there. I mean, like, look, nothing has the library that Disney and uh, and Netflix has, but they've got a lot of movies on Amazon Prime. A lot of free ones, like including Tango Shalom, but it's not <clears throat> free. Not yet. Not yet. But, uh, and uh, oh, and they also have like uh, uh, movie trailers of love stories they on, do. on Prime Video, but yeah. also not free. You got to rent it. I was going to mention that the last thing I remember watching on Amazon Prime was about the the last. I think it's the last drive-in theater in the. US. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that, I watched that, yeah. and it was like there's nothing. It's nothing crazy like an HBO documentary, but it was so interesting just to see that them have so much love for keeping this place open that they're willing to take. Um, losses like year after year and hopefully that documentary actually gets people out there it's in the middle of nowhere but it was interesting to me all right what's next uh sooth writes uh what do the likes of gravic darben black manta carnage and sabak have in common i didn't give flying shits about any of them uh oy vey okay, there you go face palm yeah no, I, like I don't think i like carnage I was going to say, I don't think they did a bad job with Carnage. No. Um, the setup maybe could have been better. But, I mean, yeah, like, it's it's a bad thing. It's a bad uh, day when, like, the audience doesn't care about your villain. Like, that's just uh, not a good day. Not a good day. All right, what's next? Richard Lai says, I think the reason why you see a fandom rooting for DCU and Elseworld movies to fail is because they're uh, down bad. They lost a universe and a filmmaker's vision they adore, which was more Lord of the Rings than MCU. But those people don't own the DCEU either. Like, just because you liked a director of a couple of films of the DCEU, you don't own that franchise. Right. Listen, I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna say something here. This is the same conversation I had to have a guy when I was a bit younger when I was dating his ex-girlfriend and he got mad about that <laughs> and it wasn't a friend of mine because that's, that's just broke. He you was your boss, that. but <laughs> it's like, I, I had to explain to him because here's, here's the thing about the situation. She did not leave her boyfriend to get together with me. She left her boyfriend. Some time passed. We got together later and that was it. And I had to say to this guy, she did not, leave you for me she left you period right and then later we got together but one had nothing to do with the other this is the same conversation i feel like their fellow movie fans need to have with those people who have that mindset <clears throat> guys they didn't end the dceu so they could do james gunn's new universe the dceu died and knowing that it was dead and failed, they said, okay, we're ending that. So what are we going to do next? And then they decided, okay, well, this is the direction we're going to go next. If James Gunn didn't come around, the DCU would still be done. You can't put out eight films in a row where none of them make over $400 million and expect that's a franchise that's going to keep existing. 
James Gunn has nothing to do with the end of the DCEU. The end of the DCEU happened, and, and, and some would argue it should have happened years ago, and then the next thing they moved on to, dude, your girl didn't leave you for me, she left you. Mm -hmm. And then later on we got together, and that's the situation here. Also, you know what I think, John? Like the Christopher <clears throat> Nolan Batman trilogy that everybody loves, now with uh, the Snyder Cut of Justice League, we have a Justice League between Man of Steel, the extended, the, the ultimate edition of Batman v Superman, and the Snyder version of Justice League. That's a pretty cool trilogy. I mean, it's a trilogy unto itself. I thoroughly enjoy watching uh, those movies. All the other stuff is kind of a mixed bag. We still got Wonder Woman 1 and Aquaman 1 out of that. There's a lot of good stuff there, but, but the Snyder trilogy, the Nolan trilogy, different visions of these characters, very respectable. I'm happy to have those movies. Yeah, depending on, I mean, one of the things you have to acknowledge, though, it's because I like every single one of those movies. Not a lot of people share that opinion with me, though. Right. I mean, unlike the Nolan trilogy that is pretty much universally loved, the reality is that the, the, the Snyder trilogy, which I enjoy and I gave thumbs up to every single one that came out, but not everybody shared my opinion. No. <laughs> so it was, so they, they had different levels of success. All right, what's next? Raymond says, kids nowadays don't have the Batman squirt gun. They don't? I don't think I had the Batman squirt gun. Was there a Batman squirt gun? I would imagine, but <laughs> I, have no idea what to do. I don't know. All Raymond, right, what's next? On. You got to explain a little more than that. Culture Wars Diplomacy says a writer of a D and D adventure is in the MCU. And oh well, oh yeah, that was when we just read. So, then, but the way Culture Wars Diplomacy put it, it sounds like it's not writer of the movie, but was one of the writers of one of the uh, yeah. That's modules. how I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't. Raymond, yeah, for those of you, for those of you who don't know, there. <coughs> in case you want to run a game, but you don't want to come up with the whole thing yourself, you can buy D and D adventure mo modules mm -hmm. that basically have an adventure set up that you, as a game master, would then run. And maybe that's who he's referring to. All right, what's next? Raymond says, um, it's funny that fans and morning talk shows are coming up with uh, ways Taylor can make the Super Bowl after her concert in Tokyo. Everybody wins, NFL fans, uh, Kristen, uh, <clears throat> just, I don't know how to say that last name, but uh, Jacket Business. Yeah, so that girl, Kristen, she's, she's another NFL player's wife, and she makes these designer jackets, and Taylor Swift wore one of those jackets? Kristen's social media following went up half a million in a day. And all of a sudden her business was a huge thing. By the way, the numbers have just come out. The game between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Baltimore Ravens is the highest viewed uh, AFC championship game in the history of the NFL. And you know, you want to know why they keep slashing the camera on Taylor at the game? Give me that. <laughs> because this game was the highest viewed AFC championship game in the history of the NFL. Because they have a whole new audience that's tuning in <laughs> yeah. for her. Yep, whole new group of people are tuning Nothing in. Nothing wrong with that. They want to watch Taylor. <laughs> they want to they want to watch I, Travis. I, okay. They well, want to see if Jason is going to do something else that makes humanity seem better. So anyway, what, what are you going to say? I, I just looked up uh, Batman squirt gun just to see what the... Uh, Man, I'm definitely getting this squirt gun. But look. look oh, at, my God. So you so you press up on his ball. I mean, I mean oh on, on, his, on his uh, pelvis. Now we know what our viewer meant. Yeah. It looks like <laughs> three separately, completely inappropriate things are happening yeah. all at the same time in that. Wow. Area. And look where the where you put the water in. Yeah. That's what I said. That's three. what I'm saying. That's why I said there are three separate things going on in this image that all look totally inappropriate. You know, that needs a reboot. Pair this with the uh, the Dune popcorn top. Yeah, movie marketing at its finest, my friends. <laughs> you got a weekend, baby. <laughs> All right, what's next? Wow. <laughs> Culture War Diplomacy. Okay, they explain and well, wrote an adventure. Uh, who plays Karen Page? Oh, okay. So they wrote, yeah, an adventure. All um, right. <clears throat> and then, uh, let me just bring this up. So Future Millionaire. I'll be honest, I no longer have any interest in Sony Spider-Man less the universe. I never did, aside from their animated movies. Yes. I mean, listen, Morbius was... I mean, that, 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 that's going to take the wind out of your sails. Any positive momentum that you have. Again, I love what they've done with, this, with the animated stuff. I really enjoyed what they did with um, the Venom films. The first one more than the second one. But I enjoyed the second one. <clears throat> I've got hope for Craven. But, I mean, listen, if this Madam Web is another... And we don't know that it is, but if it's another Morbius... Yeesh. Then they they gotta they gotta start firing some people over there at Sony, but well you know, again, let's let's hold those conversations until we actually see the movie. Right now, I'm more concerned about how they've handled the marketing of this film 
we'll see how we feel about the film itself after we see it. All right, what's next? Uh, we got uh, Joaquin who writes, Hey, John, been watching you since AMC days. What happened to the days where Disney made great sports movies? Uh, remember <laughs> the Titans? All-time classic. I don't know that there's as big of a market for sports movies today. Um, I mean, we're not seeing many great sports movies today. So, I mean, I mean, look, you look back at whether it's, you know, Miracle on Ice or you're looking back at um, Mystery Alaska. You're looking back at the Burt Reynolds movie, the whole, you know, with the... Um, uh, the, semi tough or the longest or, down or the longest, longest yard, day, longest, longest yard, yard. longest yard. That's the one with Dennis Quaid, <laughs> and he was like the the oldest rookie in baseball. Hey, any given Sunday, tin uh, cup, that, tin you cup. Know. Yeah, what was the one? Or, or was that John Ham? Who was who was the oldest? No, 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 no it was the, Dennis Quaid. Everybody's Dennis all Quaid. American. Yeah. Then there's the Natural. Yeah, with yeah. Robert Redford. I mean, there's uh, then of course all the boxing ones, and right. yeah, there's just not a. There's, there's, a lot, there's not a lot of stories that haven't been told already in movie form, one way or another. Although, sure. the yeah. boys in the boat, let's hear for George Clooney's rowing well, I'll movie. I'll tell you what, this new George Clooney movie, Boys in the Boat, two things. Seattle story. That movie's going to be awesome. I'm telling you right now, that movie's going to be awesome. The trailer gives it all away, though. Number two, nobody's going to go see it. Yeah. it. But it already came out. That's his point. There's your point. <laughs> <laughs> I 100% believe that movie's going to be awesome. But you know what? <laughs> it did better. It, it's surprising how much money that movie made. If if you look up the box office okay, for Boys in the Boat, it's surprising. All right, what's next? Travis Nickerson writes, I would love to see Nathan Fillion do his version of Uncharted. His short film was better than the Wahlberg Holland mess. No, it wasn't. Now, listen, here's, here's the thing with short fan film things. People watch them, they go, oh my gosh, that was better than me. It's like, no, it wasn't. I remember there was this um, Power Rangers short that came out. Remember about a year before the last Power Man? Oh, the direct and, Avi, Avi Shankar came on the... Was it Clutters. a great little fan film? It was amazing. It was a great little fan mm -hmm. film. Was it motion picture quality? No. No, it wasn't. It just wasn't. I love that little Nathan Fillion thing, but we're all judging it as an internet short, right? It was not better. Listen, and I don't love <laughs> that Tom Holland, Mark Wahlberg... Uh, uncharted movie but it was better than the short the short was a fine fun little internet short but that's how that's the the standard by which everybody measured it for if that was actually up on a big screen in a theater different reaction from people i think uh, and for boys in the boat 49 million it's made and the budget was 40 million <clears throat> but still 40 million who saw it you didn't even know it came out no i didn't even realize it came out already <laughs> kind of slipped under the radar <laughs> All right, what's next? All right, <laughs> these Wales writes, Shogun Rua is getting a show? So those you don't know, Shogun Rua is a, a legendary, legendary mixed martial arts fighter uh, who's had some of the most memorable, man, his fight with Dan Henderson. Uh, anyway, so, but yes, no, 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 it's, it is not a movie about that Shogun. Speaking of sports <laughs> movies. All right, what's next? Uh... <laughs> Yeah, Travis Nickerson writes, I nominate Ryan Gosling for the role of Booster Gold. Don't know how Disney can keep in my uh, keep in my opinion their best live action remake Cinderella off their streaming app. Oh, it's not on the streaming app? Cinderella? Cinderella's not on Disney Plus. There's got to be a rights issue there yeah. then. I, I mean, that's shocking to me. Yeah, Ryan <coughs> pardon me, Ryan Gosling would make a great Booster Gold. The problem is Ryan Gosling would make a great a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, a, lot of, put, a lot of rumors of Ryan Gosling and Disney right speaking now. Speaking of Ryan Gosling, I watched Gray Man last night. Nice, great film, great film. What does Rain Man have to do with Gray, Ryan? Gray Man? Gray Man. Gray. I thought you said Rain Man. I'm like, no, no, what does it have to do with the Dustin Hoffman movie? The Gray Man. Two hundred twenty million. Movie. I watched it. Not a good I, movie. I, I did like Gosling in there. He played that character pretty good. Hey, I liked Chris Evans's performance. Yeah, yeah Chris I, Evans was such a... Yeah, but it's just a bad movie. It yeah. was not good. You know, yeah. there's a scene when they're fighting in the plane as it's going down. <laughs> it, it looks like it was totally designed by a previous department. It's not that it was badly executed. It wasn't, but there's absolutely... It just lays there. That scene lays there. There's no excitement. Nothing. Well, it's a plane going down, man. Some uh, additional... <laughs> angles in case why anyone, i didn't i didn't need to see that in case any of you just said, well, <clears throat> buy one uh here's some more i did not i did not <laughs> ask to see that at all oh my god 
All right, All right. what's next? <laughs> Moving on to our members here. Uh, Mr. Goth Bob Ross Rogers, uh, with all this deserved affection for Alan Richson, what would you say as uh, for him uh, as a He-Man in live action? Ooh. I have not watched Reacher yet, though you guys speak so highly. I've watched clips. He is stellar. Look, I am not saying... He needs to have that hair. Alan is an awards-level actor. I'm not saying that at all, right? He is good for what is required of him in Reacher, and I really like him in the role. A lot. He's got a few other things coming out that we're going to get to see how he evolves, including the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare with Henry Cavill. It's going to be neat to see that. He would be a very good pick for He-Man. <laughs> yes, he oh, he would. I wow. Actually, now that you mentioned, I have a hard... We've always said this. Like, with He-Man, being huge and jacked is a core essential part of that character. Yep. And, like, but you still need to have... An actor who can carry a movie or show. Now I don't know that anybody else could be He Man other than him. <laughs> I know, you ruined it. He's going to have to play He Man and Skeletor. He's, <laughs> well, Skeletor you can have in a bodysuit, right? Because <laughs> okay. because there's there's something supernatural about him. But I mean, just put on the wig. You just give Alan a wig and he'd be good to go. Do it, man. <laughs> I mean, he does look like He Man. Yeah. All right, what's next? Um, that. Funko Dad says, today marks a couple interesting entertainment moments in history. 25 years ago today, Family Guy premiered. That's crazy. Wow. That wow. is nuts. Crazy to think they're still going strong so many years later. 55 years ago today, the Beatles had their rooftop concert, which that means they're almost the same amount of time from, from when, when that aired on Fox, the Beatles did the rooftop, and that seems so much further away. Mm. Would uh, love to hear your thoughts uh, yeah, wow. on these events. I, I don't care about the Beatles. <laughs> I'm like one of the only people alive who doesn't care about the Beatles, so not much about that. I thought you two did it better with their uh, Where the Streets Have No Name video, video but that's just me. Um, family Guy, though. Family Guy's a little hit and miss, <clears throat> but Seth MacFarlane has been, especially with Family Guy, he is absolutely fearless. He will joke about anything and everything and he and nobody is spared like family guy humor goes after everybody even canadians there's been a lot of like i've watched compilation videos on youtube of seven problem making fun of canadians and i find it hilarious it's great man and, and he'll do stuff that all the people won't won't be willing to do including like poking at our <clears throat> our stereotypes there's i watched this clip like two nights ago as a matter of fact where Somebody said, like, um, oh, what was it Peter said? It was more of a sure thing since before they let black guys run in the 100-meter dash. And then they do a cutaway, and they show all these athletes on the line getting ready to run with two white guys in the middle. And the guy, the, the, the pistol guy goes, okay, on your marks, get set. White guys, go. Boom. And these the two white guys get to run. And they get a head start. And they're talking to each other. I feel very good about today's. Yes, I, I like my chances today. Then it goes back to the guy at the line. Everybody else, go, boom. And then all these athletes, the black runners, are going to catch up to them and blow right past the white guys to the finish line. And then one of the white guys goes, phew, I thought they were after us. <laughs> and I'm like, only Seth MacFarlane can do stuff like that. He's not afraid to do humor like that. He's not allowed to, <coughs> to laugh at himself, everything he represents, everything I am, everything you are. It's, it's, it's Did, And didn't Family Guy have various iterations? Like it was on the air, then they took it off, and then they brought it back. I think and it was canceled it for one season. I think it was off, and then it came back, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And they've talked forever about doing a Family Guy movie. Um, and Seth MacFarlane's new show, Ted, it feels like a live-action Family Guy show. Yeah. it really Like, you have to watch the show, and I've only watched one episode. It's very funny, but... You have to see it to know what I mean by it. it just feels like a Family Guy show. All right, what's next? Amin says, in eight of the last 10 years, the film that has won Best Picture also won Best Screenplay. With Oppenheimer being a front runner for Best Picture, do you think that's also the front runner for Best Adapted? Nominees are American Fiction, Barbie, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, The Zone of Interest. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about this yesterday. I, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion it wins. In that, but the I think the odds are favorite that it does win. But again, look out for poor things, and look out for American fiction. 
Uh, those could take it. But Oppenheimer, I think, will win Best Picture, and and I think odds are win Best Adapted. Rob, hundred percent. There we go. I mean, I Oppenheimer is a staggering achievement. It's exactly the kind of movie Oscars love. All right, what's next? Dominic says, is there anything better than doing the studio tour at Universal Studios Hollywood? Best theme park attractions ever, in my opinion. I love Universal Studios Hollywood. I, Ann and I have annual passes. We go probably at least once a month we go. I take the studio tour every time. I take it, I do. I take the studio tour every time. I love it. I just feel entrenched in Hollywood history. Then, of course, the King Kong thing of it and the Fast and Furious thing is... Pretty cool. The Jaws thing, of course, is still great. I I love Universal Studios Hollywood way more than that other place with the fucking mouse. Plus, you've got Hol you've got uh, Hogwarts, and you have Mario World now too. Oh, the Super Nintendo World. I <clears throat> Ann and I went on an advanced preview day, and it was still packed. Right, you go through a warp pipe to go into it, and when you come out, you're just in this Nintendo world. And I'm looking around, and I'm like, this is incredible. What do you think? I looked down at Anne, and she was standing there just looking. She had tears coming out of her eyes. It was beautiful. And, and listen, I like uh, Star Wars Land at Disneyland. I think they did a very good job making that place. But the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studios Hollywood puts it to shame. Because... Every step, every detail makes you feel, and I'm not a major Harry Potter fan. I like the Harry Potter movies. I'm not a major fan. You walk into that place and you just, you feel you're in the movies, right? You feel you're there. And then you get to Hogwarts itself. And it's like, oh, like it's this huge castle. You can see all around the San Fernando Valley. It's uh, it, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. I love Universal Studios Hollywood. All right, and just you can bring you. Can, this is a thumbnail from an old interview I did. This is how much Anne loves. She she loves 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 the Super Mario and she loves Nintendo games. I mean, she but, was pretty <laughs> taken aback by the Super Mario World when you guys went. <laughs> but by the way, some people was asking. Uh, I saw somebody in live chat ask if there was any kind of interview with Anne. You can search on the channel. We we uh, we did an interview with Anne once before. If you want to get to know her a little bit. All right, what's next? Uh, Stuart uh, Kur Kuramoto says it was great to meet you at the Kevin Smith show last week. Thanks for graciously letting me have a fanboy mo moment, and thanks to Anne <laughs> for taking our pick. My question is, what's is your favorite Kevin Smith movie, and why? Uh, my favorite Kevin Smith movie is Clerks Two. Um. By the way, the evening with Kevin Smith that I went to was so great. Um, it, I had such a good time at it. But yeah, my favorite <clears throat> is um, Clerks 2 because it spoke to me at a very particular time in my life. I was at a place in my life where I was living in one place. I had some wonderful friends and family. But a career opportunity has, had availed itself for me to move away. And I was struggling with whether I should move away to pursue my career or to be around my the, my loved ones. And then I go into watch Mall, uh, Clerks 2 and that's the theme of the movie. And so it hit me on a very emotional, like I thought it was freaking hilarious, but it hit me on a very emotional level and that's why it's always going to be my favorite, uh, I think the best of my favorite Clerks film. And it was great meeting you too. Thanks for saying hi when we were there, man. All right, what's next? Ulitan says, I binged Reacher season one last night. You were right. It was great. I can't wait to watch season two. Alan Richson reminds me of Stephen Amell. Even, uh, if Steven ever plays Bruce Banner, Alan can be his Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> two different uh, movie universes, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, season two is very good. I prefer season one still a little bit more, uh, but season two is really great. They just announced season three uh, is going to be coming. And, and again, he's just great in the role. There's just something viscerally satisfying about watching a hulking good guy beating the living crap out of a bad guy. And that's what Reacher is. It's just yeah. constantly giving us that endorphin rush, right? It's it's pretty 100%. great. 100%. All right, what's next? We got Swizzard. Picked up advanced screening tickets for Dune 2, IMAX, February 25th. My wife and I uh, are expecting our first child this year in July. Uh, it's going to be a great year. That's awesome. Congratulations, man. Uh, maybe name it after that character in Dune. There you go. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe mention it a uh, little uh, Dune character. Princess Alia. 
Yeah, there you go. I like it's it. It's my <laughs> brother, Baron. Not kidding. Anne and I had a serious discussion. I think I mentioned this one time. When we were talking about kids and stuff like that, Anne and I had a very serious discussion that if we ever have a son, and again, this was a serious discussion about naming him Optimus. We, we, we thought about it. We thought about naming him Optimus. Because <laughs> uh, one of Anne's best friends, um, they had a kid, and they named him Obi. As in Obi-Wan Kenobi. They named him Obi for that. So I thought, well, why can't we name our kid Optimus? <laughs> just, just a thought. Just a thought. <laughs> All right, let's take one last question today. What's next? Um, Callum writes, hey, everyone, thoughts on CM Punk's injury? It's not been a great week for WWE. Oh, I, I hadn't heard anything about it. Yeah, man, he's out. He's out? Tour tricep. Oof. Ooh, that's not a good and they, one. And they, they purposely put him at the, at, at the end of the Rumble to keep him from getting injured, but he still got injured, so... Um, I'm not envious of whoever's trying to set up this WrestleMania, but more more than likely we're going to get Roman Reigns and The Rock from the way that The Raw is. So maybe, I don't know. They're trying to salvage everything now. All right, guys. And that'll do it for my voice in today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here, making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in the questions. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did. Um, again, uh, for those of you wondering, programming note, uh, you notice we haven't done open mics again for the last couple of days. I have been struggling uh, a little bit to get through the show, so we haven't been doing so. Still no um, open mic today. Maybe we'll be able to do an open mic tomorrow. Fingers crossed. Just let you guys know. So I want to thank the people in the room with me. Ray Aura. Squirt, squirt. <laughs> Jonathan Boyko. Yeah, I'll see you guys later. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Please send me the Raid Redemption in the steel book, <laughs> please. And most importantly, thank you to you guys. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.